at this time, I would like to introduce our panel. And I got to tell you, we're not behind yet. So uh, this panel is going to kind of set the stage. And we've got three different speakers. We have John Souter will kick it off, followed by Emily Jane Davis and Stephanie Reed. And, and John will go first. And he's so quick, he's already got started. So I'll just make his uh, intro very quick and ask him to start his video. Um, John is a PhD assistant professor in forest engineering resources and management department at OSU. Um, he's also the forest watershed specialist in the forestry and natural resource extension program. And his third claim to fame is he was the co concluding director of the watershed research co-op. So take it away, Dr. Souter, welcome. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, glad to be here. Um, as Mike said, this has been study that we started in uh, 2018. So now we're probably three years into it. Uh, and it has consumed a fair amount of my time uh, during that period. What I'd like to do in this first session is, is really provide a foundation for our discussions um, in the remaining uh, time in the conference for that. Uh, and talk a little bit about Oregon's forest, uh, talk a little bit about the community uh, water supply, watersheds that we've been working on, uh, and emphasize the, the dynamic nature of, of forest in Oregon. And so uh, a lot of us are familiar with, with the extent of forest in Oregon. Uh, about 47% of the state is forested. Uh, and that definition uh, is if there is 10% forest cover um, uh, or more, 60% uh, of it's federally owned, uh, there are smaller uh, portions of state, local ownership, tribal ownership. Uh, and we have a significant presence of large private industrial timber ownerships. Uh, and then the remainder is small private ownerships either uh, zoned as forestry, a lot of uh, joint uh, uh, zoning is ag forestry and rural residential. Overlaying on these forests uh, are uh, watersheds uh, that supply uh, drinking water to uh, three and a half million people uh, in the state of Oregon. Uh, these are uh, uh, community water supplies or public water supplies that rely on surface water as their primary source. Uh, 156 of these that are outlined in the red here uh, are classified as community water systems under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. And a community water system is defined as having at least 15 hookups uh, serving uh, at least 25 people year round. And so the difference between the 156 community water supplies and the 337 public water supplies uh, is that the other systems may be either smaller than that threshold uh, or they may be seasonal such as campgrounds and, and uh, installations like that. Uh, the size of these watersheds ranges from uh, a small of, of about 200 acres or so uh, particularly small ones uh, seem to be um, uh, predominant in the coastal region, uh, up to about 350 square miles of some of those watersheds that drain the, the west slope of the Cascades are, are large. Um, you'll notice in the eastern part of the state that there are actually few uh, 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 community water supplies that rely on surface water. And that's largely partially because of the, the nature of the precipitation uh, patterns out there, but also the fact that a lot of those uh, uh, community water supplies in that part of the state uh, rely on groundwater. And so they're not as directly under the influence of what's happening in the forest. So as you can see in the diagram, uh, a lot of the, or most of these community water supplies have significant or in, are, are entirely forested. And so then the effect of forest management uh, is significant in, in terms of what they're receiving both in quantity and quality terms of, for their raw water. So who owns these? So if we look at forest uh, ownership in there, there's a difference between the proportions that are 
are statewide and the proportions that are in these community water supplies. And in the community water supplies and this table, the right-hand column, uh, the forest service that manages about half of the forest in the state manages only about 20% of the area that's in, the, in these uh, source watersheds for, for the drinking water systems. You know, and the pattern is fairly similar uh, with the BLM uh, and other federal uh, in contrast, what you'll see is that a lot of the state and local, while it's only 4% of, of the overall forest ownership, it's almost 10% of the land within these source watersheds. And that includes a number of systems that uh, community water supplies that actually own their own source watersheds for it. And then finally, you can see that there's actually a disproportionate uh, proportion of industrial uh, forest land uh, that is within these community water supplies uh, versus their overall ownership of forest land. And that's significant for it. And, and, and part of the focus for this project was looking at what the effects of that active forest management is. So I want to talk a little bit about forest cover and forest cover changes. So we talked about the, the forest cover, but we haven't really focused so much on the forest cover change. Uh, and I've uh, been working uh, over the past couple of years with Robert Kennedy uh, and Peter Clary in the Land Trender um, uh, program at OSU, and they've been modeling uh, forest cover changes uh, based on Landsat data. And we have this from 1986 uh, until 2020. And you can see in this animation that Peter uh, did an amazing job with, you know, that we have these Con essentially constant changes in forest cover uh, through there. And we divided that or were able to interpret that into these uh, five or six different categories here. Uh, so we have in the red is fire and that's a, a fairly abrupt change. Uh, and that comes essentially from the surveys that the Forest Service and the state does every year for annual fire amounts and locations. Long disturbances, the yellow pattern, uh, are really insect and disease. And you can see that those are concentrated um, uh, primarily on the east slope of the Cascades and some into the eastern part of, of the state. Short disturbances uh, would, be, uh, would include a lot of the harvest uh, that we're seeing. Uh, some of this harvest is fairly difficult to note because of the scale, the statewide scale of this. If you zoom into any particular portion, you can actually uh, see that. And then the long recovery is the regrowth after, after a disturbance for it. And so if you look at that in the context of the uh, community water supply watersheds with that outline, of them is that you see that there's about on average of 400,000 acres of forest cover change a year uh, and that can range from a high of, of, two, of 816. Uh, when we put the 2020 data in we'll see that it's quite a bit higher because we have almost uh, uh, slightly over a million acres of forest from the Labor Day fires uh, and down to, a, <coughs> excuse me, down to a low of about 120,000 acres. You know, and that's resulting from all of these uh, uh, patterns of, of disturbances that change forest cover. So what, the, what we really focused on in this, in this project is looking at the effects of active forest management on these forest cover changes uh, for it. And the way that we started uh, with that is to look at the notification of operations uh, that are filed with the Oregon Department of Forestry uh, prior to uh, forest management activities. Uh, and that includes activities on all of the state, local, uh, private forest, and it also includes harvest in the, on the federal forest because those are subject to excise taxes. So we started with the first calendar year that, this, that the FERN system uh, that, that ODF created the web-based system. Uh, the first full calendar year that data was available for that was in 2015. And then we, since we started the study in, in 2018, uh, we got the, the data through 2018 for that, for the analysis. 
we had and reviewed and kind of analyzed, uh, worked through about 60,000 of these notifications of operations. And that included over 100,000 uh, unique units and activities. Uh, a number of these notifications included multiple activities in them. In fact, not, you know, slightly fewer than half of them had multiple activities, would, which would be two separate, potentially two separate harvest activities or two separate types of management activities. Uh, and then we started to, to kind of put those into bins uh, for harvest related activities, uh, road related activities and, and reforestation. And it's important to note that, that not every notification actually results in an, in an operation. Uh, and some operations that extend across calendar years may have more than one notification for them. Uh, so the data is not uh, exact, but uh, I think it gives a pretty good uh, indication of what's happening out there on the landscape. So if we looked at the harvest uh, piece, uh, we've got these uh, about six different types of, of harvest activities that are broken out in, in these notifications. Uh, the two that were really probably uh, uh, more interested in focusing on are the, the clear cuts or the even age management, and that's about uh, 210 acres or so of a year annually, uh, and the thinning, which is a, about 400,000 uh, acres uh, a year for it. Uh, other things, and certainly this, this coming year, uh, now salvage is, is, has been significant, and it's just the, the, the ceiling is blown uh, through with that in this, this year and coming year for that. And then there's uh, also fuels reduction treatments. Uh, a lot of that is over in Eastern Oregon in the uh, juniper stands for it. And as you can see from the, the table there that we do have quite a bit of variability annually uh, in it, particularly in terms of the harvest parts of it. Uh, and that's largely a result of market forces. Timber prices are good. Harvesting, a lot more harvesting picks up, goes on, timber prices are bad, some prices are bad, the, the amount of harvest are reduced for it. So similarly with, with road work, and the road work really does correspond quite a bit to the, the harvest or precedes it uh, to the harvest. So we have these uh, six different types of activities there. We have the right of way uh, development into, into uh, areas of harvest and there's the felling and, and hauling uh, related to that. That's about 300 miles of, of road a year. Uh, there are fire fuel breaks. Again, we talked about the focus, the focus of that being in uh, primarily in Eastern Oregon. Uh, road maintenance activities, there's herbicide applications on around 1,000 miles of road, and we'll cover that later this afternoon in, uh, in the forest chemicals. Uh, there's uh, new roads that get punched in, about 800 uh, miles a year or so, but there's almost twice as much of road that gets reconstructed and, and, and upgraded uh, prior to harvest activity or just in terms of routine maintenance. Uh, and then it's a little bit unclear on some of what, what some of these other and special um, uh, activities relate to. You know, but the road work is, uh, again, uh, uh, especially the construction part uh, uh, is fairly closely related to the harvest activity. For them. Okay, and then after harvest, uh, there is uh, reforestation required under the Forest Practice Act. And the uh, activities that are incorporated into this reforestation uh, involve uh, animal damage control and um, um, uh, fertilization, about 100,000 acres of fertilization uh, as a part of that, uh, herbicides for site preparation, about 600,000 acres a year. That corresponds uh, closely to the amount of clear cuts for it. Uh, you have pre-commercial thins, and then you also have uh, a slash and uh, 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 site preparation work for it. And again, the fire here is prescribed fire uh, for it. And again, largely that is either burning piles uh, after harvest or, uh, or uh, uh, fuels reduction treatment in the eastern part of the state. 
So how do streams uh, get protected and specifically how do drinking water streams get protected uh, under the Forest Practice Act? So uh, domestic streams or drinking water source streams, whether they're for private individuals, uh, systems, public water systems, community water systems, are classified as domestic streams under the Forest Practice Act. Uh, and that means that there is a minimum of a 20 foot buffer uh, upstream of that intake for it. Uh, and in many cases, the buffers are wider than that because the streams are classified as a fish bearing stream or um, uh, medium size or large size streams that have larger buffers. Uh, but there is a, a minimum of at least a 20 foot buffer on that. Uh, uh, as a result of SB 1602, uh, there's additional spray buffer widths in um, uh, uh, community water supply streams uh, and, and domestic streams. And we'll talk about some of that later this afternoon as, as well. And then for community water supplies, uh, if the source area is less than 100 square miles, the source watershed is less than 100 square miles, uh, then the people who are filing the notification are supposed to inform the community water supply that they're going to conduct those operations. Okay, so uh, Mike talked a little bit about the, the trees to tap re review. Uh, again, I'll, I'll summarize what we did with that. So uh, we were emphasizing uh, three different forest management types, harvest, uh, forest roads, and revegetation. Uh, we looked at uh, four different types of, 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 of activities, uh, of, uh, effects of management activities, water quantity and timing, sediment and turbidity, forest chemicals are the ones that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and so what we ended up with, as well as the science review, uh, we have the survey and case studies of community water suppliers that EJ is going to, uh, Emily Jane is going to talk about. We had some policy background that, that Jeff Behan did. Uh, and then there will be a, a forthcoming for community water suppliers an, an atlas of information that's specific to each system. Uh, but I wanna be clear that one of the things that we were not asked to do and did not do was evaluate the effectiveness of the Forest Practice Act uh, to protect drinking water quali quality. Uh, so with that, I will, uh, turn it back to uh, Mike and, and uh, let us proceed. Thank you, John. That's excellent. Sorry to have to limit you in time. There, there's at least an hour's worth of stuff you could talk about. Um, but next up is Dr. Emily Jane Davis. And Emily Jane, PhD, is Assistant Professor in the Forest Ecosystems and Society Department at OSU and also a forestry extension specialist like John, but her expertise is in social science, um, surveys, and uh, collaboratives. So Emily Jane's gonna talk to us about the survey she led on the drinking water providers. So take it away, Emily Jane. Great, can you hear me, Mike? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So thank you for having me today. As Mike noted, I'm going to be sharing some results from this survey of those um, 156 drinking water providers, community providers that John mentioned. Um, our goal in that survey was to learn more about the management approaches and management concerns of those providers in forested source watersheds. As a roadmap of what I'll be talking about with you today, I'll just quickly go over who we surveyed, the response rate, the characteristics of those water systems that uh, replied to the survey, their perceptions of issues of management concern, how they do planning and use data and partnerships to manage their watershed, and some lessons learned. I won't be covering absolutely everything we went over in the survey, so I encourage you to read the, this chapter in the Trees of Tap book when it comes out. Uh, to do this survey, we wanted to try to reach out to all of the community drinking water providers um, all 156 of them. First, we reached out through the H2 Oregon uh, newsletter that goes out to them to let them know this would be coming. We then provided an email notification and then a series of email invitations directly to all 156 of those folks. Um, in order to then continue to bring the response rate up, we conducted some targeted follow-up with those systems that had different features of interest to our advisory committee, industrial private timberland, public forest land, 
and local government ownership just to try to get at some of their characteristics. And our final response rate was 54 respondents, which is 34% of those 156 systems in Oregon. So I'll spend a minute here talking about the characteristics of those respondent systems so you understand who's better represented in these data than, than other systems. Um, the first thing to know is that, as John noted, there are fewer systems in the, over in the Eastern Oregon area, Northeastern Oregon area. We generally divided our respondents into three very broad categories for the survey, coast, valleys, and dry side. And so the proportional to the total number of, of systems in each of those three areas, the survey responses actually overrepresent the coast and dry side systems and underrepresent the valley. I would like to note that we did have only two respondents from the dry side um, and that that's not a very large number of respondents. So more work would need to be done to learn about those other watersheds as well. So the size of the systems that were in our survey, again, that varied a lot as well. So this, um, the size of populations that was served by our respondent systems was on the small end, 29, and on the large end, 183,525, with a mean population service size of almost 16,000. And then there was also quite a bit of variability in the size of the primary source watersheds that these respondent systems were from. So, but respondents from those smaller primary source watersheds of less than 10 square miles were the largest proportion of responses at 41%. A majority of over 60% were from watersheds that were smaller than 100 square miles. And we only had 11% from watersheds that would be over 350 square miles. Understanding how these um, utility drinking water providers are organized is also important because it helps us understand their capacity to manage their drinking water supplies. So looking at budget, 50% of our respondents had a budget of $500,000 a year or less. And of that, almost a quarter had a budget of $100,000 a year or less. Um, the systems with where the utility had larger budgets were less represented. Um, only 6% of our respondents had budgets of over $10 million, for example. And then staff size is another factor in the capacity to manage a system. The mean total staff size that we had was 13, but a range from zero to 200 staff total were reported. Um, a majority had one to 10 total staff. And we did have a few respondents, seven of them who noted that they had no paid employees and relied solely on volunteers like homeowners in the association to provide those responsibilities. I'll also note that uh, the type of system that, or the type of governance of these systems, the majority of them, about 56% of them, were organized as departments or units of, of a municipal government. So that's the most common, commonly represented one. A little more than a quarter were special districts. Now I'll be talking about the different ways we asked respondents to talk about their management concerns in their source watersheds. Um, the first way we asked them to talk about it was we asked them to rank 10 general issues of source water management concern from one to 10 in order of current concern. So the number one concern would be their top concern, 10 would be their, their least concern. The intent of this was to observe the relative levels of concern about general categories of activities or issues. And then we moved on to asking more specific um, management issues. So again, these are very broad categories of management concerns. I'm highlighting the top ones for your attention. Um, this table includes both weighted rankings and is organized by weighted rankings over there on the right side, which account for both the number of mentions and the rank of mentions. So for the number one issue of concern, 37% uh, respondents selected forest harvesting management, as you can see. And then that was followed by stormwater runoff, which was selected by 20%. If you look also at the number two issues of concern, nearly a quarter of resident, uh, respondents chose forest harvest and management for their second top issue of concern, and 16% chose stormwater runoff as well. Next, we asked respondents to identify their level of concern about a series of more specific source water issues. So the last table was showing those more general categories. This is getting a little more specific. Um, we asked them to rate each issue on a five-point scale, where one was this issue is not a concern at all, and five was this is an extreme concern. So higher values are going to indicate higher concerns there. Um, the highest average ranking, that in, so in, uh, highest rating indicating the issues the most concerned were for potential wildfire impacts, turbidity or suspended sediments, increased wildfire risks, and forest chemicals. 
And if we looked at the issues related to wildfire, because there were a few different ones that we asked about, those together, um, you know, potential impacts, increased risk, and response impacts together averaged a rating of 3.7. We asked about several other issues as well. We have a longer table, but for the sake of space, I'm highlighting the concerns that were more rated more highly. I'll also note that these concerns um, showed some variability by region, and some respondents wrote in some comments about this. So, for example, um, for wildfire impacts and increased wildfire risk, dry side respondents were mo more concerned with that. Um, for turbidity, respondents in the valleys area had the highest concern. And for forest chemicals, coastal respondents had the highest concern. Um, some of the additional comments that folks added also indicated that these were concerns that could vary over space and time. So, for example, turbidity could be more of a concern in the winter months in coastal systems or forest chemicals might not be a concern right at the moment for a particular drinking water provider, but they might be aware of a planned future herbicide application that would increase that concern. So these concerns do capture for some folks a, a moment in time that might be different if we surveyed them again today. We also attempted to obtain another perspective on the issues of concern by forcing respondents to choose their top two issues that concerns them the most. We use that same list of the more specific source water protection concerns and allowed them to only select two as a top issue. Um, so just order over a quarter of respondents when asked about it this way, selected turbidity and suspended sediment as, sediment as a top concern. Um, and forest chemicals were the second most common, common top concern. Every other issue was selected by 10% or less of respondents as a top issue. So that shows more variability in what the top concerns are. Another, another aspect of concern can also be the sense of control that one has over a situation. Um, so we wanted to understand how respondents perceived their control of these source water management issues. Um, so we asked them again to rate each of the same issues on a control scale, where one was they felt they had no control at all, and five was they felt they had total control of the issue. And looking at control and comparing it with different concerns can give us a relative sense of um, how much control water providers feel they may have or ability they may have to manage some of these issues. Our results largely indicated that there was a strong sense of a lack of control over management issues that might affect drinking water. Um, the top issues that they perceived the least control over by the mean rating were flood events, nutrient levels, and water temperatures. But large majorities felt they had no control at all over all of the issues that you see listed on the screen as well. Um, the percentages of respondents who selected no control at all for it were above 40% for every listed issue and above 50% for all the three issues. We also found that when we compared control and um, concern, our, uh, that there were pretty big differences between how substantial a concern was for folks and how much control they perceived having over it. So we found the largest differences between a sense of control and a sense of concern for potential wildfire impacts, forest chemicals, increased wildfire risk, and wildfire response impacts. We did also ask a series of questions, again, around how they do manage their, their watersheds. Um, first, we asked a question about different types of plans and data collection requirements that may exist. So a majority of them had updated source water assessments, 62% but not drinking water source protection plans. So 41% of folks did not have that. And then um, a majority did not also, 58% did not collect optional raw water quality data beyond what was legally required. We also, also asked some follow-up questions about how people used those. Um, generally, the source water assessments were reportedly used to build understanding of potential risks and vulnerabilities, as you might expect and then as the basis for planning strategies that would mitigate them. Drinking water source protection plans were also used to identify the same kinds of potential risks and strategies, but also then used for grant application, program development, and, and outreach, so were useful tools. Optional raw water quality data were gathered for a variety of chemicals, um, for a variety of chemicals, for al algae and um, conditions and levels, and then for purposes like planning operational water treatment decisions, learning about the potential effects of herbicide spraying, informing the public, and for creating baselines that could be measured against in future years. We also wanted to understand if um, the managers of the drinking water systems work together with other landowners or other entities in managing the source watershed. 
and to explain how they did it. So a majority, just 50%, 51% reported, yes, we work with others in our watershed. 42 did not. Um, additional open-ended information about these showed that they, they really run a whole spectrum from very, um, very limited contacts around access, contacts with needing to get into the watershed, all the way up to large multi-partner, multi-year partnerships that involved a lot of collaboration and coordination. Um, there's also a large degree of formality to informality. So some of these were, again, informal conversations amongst a few people. Others were large formalized collaborative partnerships, regular meetings, and established collaboration. We also asked respondents to name the entities they interacted with the most in the management of their source watershed. Um, so who are the top five partners that you interact with the most in managing your source watershed? Number one being the most important. We did uh, weighted rankings on this as well, just to understand number of mentions and rank of mentions as well. Um, the most common type of number one partner was private timberland owners. And then that was also followed by source watershed, um, watershed councils and soil and water conservation districts. We provide an opportunity for respondents to also give us responses to a final open-ended question. What's, a, what's the lesson you've learned in managing your drinking water supply? And what would you tell someone else in your position, just coming into your position? And there are a lot of interesting answers. I kind of grouped them into a few themes. So one was the importance of communications, um, knowing, you know, knowing who to call when different issues might arise, um, communicating regularly with landowners and other regular entities. Some specifically suggested having connections with logging foremen and crews who were on the ground and being able to have real-time discussions about forest operations. Um, this was just really advised. And communications and relationships in a more informal and continuous sense was mentioned more than those more formal partnerships or collaboration. A number of responses also emphasized the, emphasized the importance of being proactive and prepared rather than waiting for something to happen and then having to respond to it without preparation. So they described learning from experiences where they were not prepared, didn't know who to call. Um, activities to foster this preparation included regular examination of the watershed, ongoing awareness of what might be normal and not normal, um, practicing different scenarios, stocking supplies like filter bags for filtration, updating their assessments and plans, and having all their necessary documentation. And then finally, a few recommended active plans for forest management and having a holistic vision for forest health in the watershed is important. So I'll just finish by noting that we had um, a few themes and questions that this raised that I'm hoping to explore through future research. One is, how do drinking water systems capacities match their management needs? So do the budgets and staff and resources of smaller systems in particular, are they sufficient to match the issues and needs in the source watersheds? Also, are the assessments, plans, and monitoring programs that I briefly mentioned allowing more structured understanding of source water management issues? prioritization of actions, and are they informing partnerships with other entities? And then finally, we know there's a lot of interest in partnerships for forest management in places like Colorado and the Front Range, where there's been um, effects from wildfire. Those are really large public, public land settings, very large communities. What lessons can be learned from those, but how might models look different at different scales and in settings where you may have smaller watersheds, different land ownership models, smaller communities, and maybe more in informal partnership models? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Emily Jane. And I want to encourage all of you to read chapter two in the book, um, chapter two in the working papers, and, and read about this survey. It, it's really incredible, the work that they've done. So at this time now, I would like to introduce Stephanie Reed and ask her to uh, join us and share her screen. Um, Stephanie is the city engineer with the city of Lincoln City. Look at that. It just went boom from one to the other. These people are incredible. Um, in addition to a lot of other duties, um, Stephanie Mattis manages the, the, the water system. And that's what she's going to talk to us about is uh, Lincoln City's water treatment. So take it away, Stephanie. All right. She's okay. Here. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. This is Zoom. Um, we expect this. Take it away. Thank you. 
Um, so today, um, yeah, I'm the city engineer for the city of Lincoln City, and um, I'm, I guess we're one of the 336 municipal providers. Um, although we, just for the record, we work closely with um, our community water providers, um, um, and it's, it, is a, it is a relationship that you build, and, I, and we, we happen to had a fire at Panther Creek, um, and they were partially um, damaged. So it's been interesting um, learning about the community uh, water um, provider struggles. So I'm going to talk today, I'm going to be very narrow focused on sediment. And so that's kind of the theme here. Um, I'll, uh, let's see. Um, our watershed is called, is, is our, our water uh, source is called Schooner Creek, and um, it's actually the, the real Schooner Creek. There's a ton of Schooner Creeks on the coast, but there's a, you know, schooner that actually, you know, sunk at the mouth, so it's the, it's, it's the real deal, Schooner Creek. Uh, it's about three miles inland. Uh, we pump into the city, um, so you can see on the left there, there's um, uh, the, uh, this is our water district that we provide to. This is our watershed. I wanted to point out here, um, this is Schooner Creek, North Fork, South Fork, and Erickson Creek. Um, the contour lines are, are, are 100 foot contour lines, those yellow ones. So, I mean, it's a very steep uh, uh, area. It's only about uh, a little less than 10,000 acres. Most of it is managed by the Sayuslaw National Forest and some of it is, the rest of it is private timberlands. We provide water to 6,400 customers, um, but during our peak season, we uh, go, uh, our, our population can go to up to 40,000. So we have right now, I mean, this is a small creek. Our low summer flows, um, our average low summer flows are 13 CFS, and we're required to keep eight CFS in the creek. Um, so there's not a lot of room to, you know, mess around. Um, and basically from July to, to, uh, to uh, uh, September, when the first rains come, we're all biting our nails. So that's just how we roll. Um, this is a map of the ownerships, particularly, um, and you'll know we do. We did buy uh, about 150 acres um, where, let's see if I get, uh, where, and it's a nice acreage. It's it's it straddles the creek. Um, um, that was uh, 450 thousand dollars. I mean, we can't you know buy everything. So, and here's our plant here, by the way. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to start with the story of where we are, where, when, why sediment is so important to us and why, you know, what our risks have been and, and, and things have that happened in the past. So in the 96 event, flood, flood event, we had a complete uh, landslide that completely blocked Schooner Creek. We could not deliver water. There was no, the creek, we couldn't do it. And I wasn't there at the time, but the decision was made, this can't happen again. I mean, we have to be able to protect ourselves from these, you know, you know, major landslides. And there's quite a few of them. It's very prone up there. And so rather than try to, you know, make sure no landslides happened again, we built a new intake um, on Drift Creek, which is just south of our watershed. And within, I think it's about three quarters of a mile to pump to our treatment plants. We were really fortunate. However, this took, I mean, this was like a 10 year process to get the permit and then another 10 years to construct and ended up being, you know, $20 million total. And we can only use it. We can't use it as, as a, you know, low flow water or we're out, we, we need to tap into drift. Frankly, if, if schooners dry, drift is dry too. So it's just for an emergency in case we have another huge landslide. So now we kind of got that done. I mean, that was, we finished that project in about 10, I guess. And along came the source water protection plans that were developed by Department of Environmental Quality and uh, Oregon Health Authority. And ours was really telling, it was very interesting. Um, it identified our potential, potential contaminant sources. And there were clear cuts, road density, stream crossings, and slide areas. The largest source, um, our largest risk was sedimentation 
from road density. Well, what does that mean? Okay, so, so we've got 10 miles of county road that of course hugs the creek and hugs Erickson. And then we've got numerous miles of the logging roads. We digitize these from the air. I don't know if that's exactly true, but a lot of, ro lot of road activity, a lot of carving into the soil. Um, and then further, the protection plan went into identifying our biggest risk uh, to, set a, to, to, to our water quality at the plant was uh, the gravel road that runs uh, parallel to the creek. And so why, so, okay, why is sediment so important? I mean, like, what's the big deal? I mean, um, and so I'm gonna just kind of go into that, what the impacts are to, 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 our, to our treatment plant when we get any sediment. And really we're looking at three different kinds. We're looking at that huge landslide uh, situation. And then we're looking at, um, you know, big rains that we get, we kind of assume we're gonna get some sediment. And then we've got this every time it rains. So we were looking at the last two um, with this study. We'll, we'll get into that more. So, you know, you, you bring in the water, uh, disinfect, uh, coagulation. We do a sedimentation filter and then storage or, or actually clarifying. And then a membrane, and, th and that's our, we use a conventional treatment train. Uh, the membrane treatment train is also used by others and sediment has an equally detrimental effect. Um, with, you, with high turbidity levels, you get longer run times, higher energy costs, chemical costs, labor costs, and waste disposal costs. Um, here's a, the, so, so this is after a pretty big episode. Um, we had uh, 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 the, the, the left hose is coming in from, right from the, the creek. The middle hose is after it's been through you know, 80% of the treatment. And so it, 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 it depends on the last treatment to, um, to actually get clear enough and clean enough to, 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 to take to town. So what happens when we get these sediment loads, our intake screen uh, velocity gets reduced. I mean, the, 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 the area gets reduced and increases the velocity and it's a, a, a fish becomes susceptible to entrapment. The line that brings it in uh, gets uh, sediment filled and it reduces the capacity. Um, the chemical demands, uh, flocculation, it goes, you know, we have to flocculate and spend a lot more chemicals on a high uh, turbid um, water. The clarifiers get plugged. We have to clean those. And ironically, we have to use our potable water that we treat, that we, you know, our, our plant water to clean that, so um, to clean those. And it, it all, all in all, it really reduces, it adds cost to operations. It reduces our operations by up to 60, 70% um, time-wise. And then we've got all these settled solids we need to get rid of. Um, again, more sediment, more settled solids. So along comes this um, project that is the longest name we have of our projects to yet Schooner Creek Sediment Reduction Drinking Water Providers Partnership Project. And what it is, is our Salmon Reef, our, our, our Watershed Council and us received a grant from a partnership, which is a whole host of people who contribute. And we work with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Forest Service, we're a bunch of partners, especially the county. And the project, the, ident, the, the objective was to identify the sediment reduction actions and priorities. So we hired um, uh, uh, John Sanchez with Cutthroat Country Consulting LLC, did a fantastic job. And what we did is, what he did is he focused on the four and a half miles right above the intake that um, Schooner Creek Road uh, followed. So we went pretty down, we, they walked the whole thing, they looked at all of the sources of, 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 of sediment. Um, the usual suspects, you know, the perch culverts, we'd already done a lot of, the, the Watershed Council had done a lot of work. I was surprised there was still 14 left because they've been doing a lot of lowering the, the culverts. Yes, um, we also said, hey, this, that, you know, this, there's no rocking in the pullout so that it gets muddy and it oozes down. The worst thing and the most egregious and clearly the biggest source of, of, of sediment in our creek was from the county. Okay, so the county's got one job. The county's job is to keep the road open for logging trucks for everybody else. And when they get 
you know, stuff from the upper, the, you know, the, the cut from the top comes down, washes down, they grate it off and they dump it between the creek and the road. It's called side casting. And what that does, every time it rains, it dribbles and, and uh, gets contaminated sediment. Uh, it gets sediment into the creek. So the, one of the big findings from this report that John did was um, we need to find a site where the county can take their spoils. Because they didn't have any place to take them. The road was the only place to put it. And so he uh, worked. So we actually ended up, so, so then the report came out and then we applied for other grants. The city put in some money and we developed a partnership with this timber company, Hancock, um, to construct a fill site for the county to place their dirt. And they've agreed to do that. Um, the formal agreement is between Hancock and the county. Our agreements are, t are totally loose. We do have one verbal about they don't, they don't apply herbicides along the road. Um, they, spot, they spot spray. Um, and they say, you know, they've agreed to do this. So, um, you know, the, the, formal, the formal agreements are, are pretty hard to come by around here. Anyway, so then they, they took, they, they transported also, they cleaned up all of the side cast that was there. So it was over a thousand cubic yards. They did that during the summer and took it up to the, to the site. They really do like it. I mean, the guys wanted to do a good job. They just didn't have a place to take it. So I'm just gonna end with, you know, like why, you know, for us, like this is it. Like we don't have a lot of other sources to like, oh, if this, if this one, if it's not producing water, if it doesn't get, you know, the, the, the surface water um, function doesn't work and we, and we, you know, we have a drought year or, um, or if we have, chem you know, chemicals that those are, those are risks, of course. But if, if like, if we don't protect this water source, um, uh, we have no choice. We have to, we depend on it. And yet here we, here we really have no control. And I agree with the control question is really no control is that is how we feel. That's why there's talk of trying to buy the watershed. Um, and you know, that's hugely expensive. So we're vested in, in this quality of Schooner Creek and continuing to work with our neighbors up there. And I'm really excited. Thank you so much for inviting me because I don't know if I would have discovered this and it's going to be Val very valuable information for me to bring back to my team. So thank right. you. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. And thank you for the whole intro panel. Hopefully this gives people a, a feel of why we did the study, some of the early findings, and, and we'll now dive in.